Today we'll speak on the topic, the new life and anapanasati meditation. How are they interrelated? What do they have to do with each other? Please don't go and get all excited about the words new life and think that it's something special or extraordinary. When we talk about the new life, we just mean that it's, it's something different than this current life which is full of problems. When we talk about new life, we mean something very, very ordinary, a life that is free of all these troublesome difficulties. This, this common life that we're living is full of all kinds of heavy, heavy problems. In, in all, in many different ways. For example, the physical aspect of life is full of some very heavy problems, namely birth, getting old, getting sick, and death. These can be very troublesome difficulties for us. And then the fact that all the things in this world never quite go the way we want them and often end up completely opposite to how we would like them to be. This, this is troublesome for us. And then in society, having to live in a society that is full of so many difficulties, so many, so many things that we could compare it to having to live in the midst of a loony bin with a bunch of crazy, insane people, all kinds of happiness and sadness coming to, to disturb the mind constantly. This is what life in this world is like, full of all kinds of problems. The first of these problems has a lot to do with the words we use. For example, the word happiness. This word happiness can mean all kinds of things to all kinds of people. And so we often don't know what it means. In terms of the old life, it has one kind of meaning. In terms of new life, happiness means something very much different. But we don't know this. We don't understand this. This word happiness is very ambiguous. And so this is the first thing for us to go into today. We need to understand the problem of happiness. As for the happiness in the old way of life, you're all quite familiar with this. The things that people are calling happiness, we know what these things are. But the happiness of new life is something much different. The happiness of new life is above, is beyond, that common happiness of the old life. This happiness of the new life is so different that it's above both happiness and suffering. It has nothing to do with these common worldly kinds of happiness and, and suffering. This we need to understand, this tremendous difference between happiness of old life and happiness of new life. The common kind of happiness is opposed to suffering. In the old way, suffering and happiness are opposites. But the happiness, but that kind of happiness isn't true happiness. In the new life, Happiness is, does not have either, <clears throat> in the new life, happiness is when we are completely free of, when we have nothing to do with that common kind of suffering and happiness. This is the real meaning of happiness, the happiness that is above, beyond suffering and the and the opposite of suffering, that common happiness, false happiness. If we can understand this, 
we will understand Buddhism. So we ask you to, to try, to try and understand the happiness that is, be, or the thing which is beyond suffering and happiness. Even in the language of Buddhism, it can be difficult to talk about these things. We talk about the ordinary happiness. And then we talk about, we say there's something beyond that. And so we talk about being above happiness. But then what are we going to call that? What do we call that? We have to go and call it happiness too. But it's a much different thing, but what we don't have another word to talk about it. So we talk about the ordinary happiness, which is suffering, and then the, the happiness, the utmost, the supreme, the fullest, most perfect happiness, which is above happiness. This is what we have to understand. See, the problem is that even if we emphasize the highest happiness, the supreme happiness, the person listening still gives, understands that and views that in terms of the common happiness. They give this supreme happiness the same kind of quality as common happiness. And so they don't understand what we're talking about when we say the supreme happiness that is above, beyond happiness. (coughs) This is our problem that we have to work to try and solve. And a simple and clear way to discriminate between these two meanings or, or levels of happiness is that the first kind of happiness is a happiness which is the basis for attachment, for clinging, for all kinds of egoistic thinking. Whereas the happiness that is above happiness is no basis, has nothing to do with attachment and clinging and any of the egoistic thinking. So to understand this distinction will help us to discover and find the true happiness, which is free of attachment beyond the common happiness. Something for us to study that requires careful observation is that dukkha, suffering in the true meaning of this word, always comes from attachment. As soon as there is any feeling of I and mine towards something, this will lead to dukkha. So if there is happiness and we attach, we cling to that happiness, that happiness becomes suffering. If we attach to goodness, that goodness becomes dukkha. Even if we attach to the state of being free of dukkha, then that turns into dukkha. Whatever it is, if attachment arises towards the thing or the state, then it becomes dukkha. There's no exception to this, this law. So let's understand this word attachment properly. Attachment means to, to pick something up, hang on to it, and carry it around. You should be able to understand this easily. To carry something around with us is to attach to it. If we pick up a heavy rock, if we pick up a rock, and carry it around, it's heavy. If we pick up big diamonds and jewels and carry them around, they're just as heavy. People may think that there's a tremendous difference between rocks and diamonds, but if we go and carry them around, if we attach to them, they're equally heavy. This is what attachment is like. We should understand this phenomena and be very, very careful not to go lugging things around, making our, our life heavy. 
in new life or for new life we desire a life that is without dukkha without misery and so therefore we must discriminate between common happiness that is a basis of attachment and the supreme happiness which is no no basis for attachment then understanding this we can live our lives without any attachment and then there is that new life free of dukkha free of suffering which has this supreme happiness the happiness that has nothing to do with attachment the happy, the life that is free of of heaviness the 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 life that has a kind of happiness which we don't we do not turn into a burden of life if we cling to the happiness it becomes the burden a burden for our lives the new life that we're interested in is free of all these burdens and suffering now let's look at the thing life for a moment in life if we go in attach to anything that life becomes a burden for itself that life becomes heavy because of the attachment if in life we go in attach to anything whether to diamonds or to rocks that life becomes a burden if in if in life we attach to being good having a good life or attach to being bad having a bad life then this becomes very heavy the rocks the diamonds the good and the bad are equally heavy if we insist on carrying them around with us the new life we don't do that we don't cling to these things we don't make these things into burdens to lug around with us in the new life we're free of that this is the thing we're interested in when we say that if in life we don't attach to it as me or my life as i am this life or this is my life we say that if we don't attach in this way there's no burden there's no dukkha but then the problem or the question always comes up how can we do that how is that possible many people when they hear that by not taking life to be i or mine there'll be no burden they say we can't do that that's too much for us we have to ask that instead of jumping to conclusions thinking foolishly or impetuously we ask that instead we we listen carefully and try to understand this and then patiently learn how to apply this understanding in our lives in order to see that it is possible to see for ourselves how it is possible just by living life without this this clinging to things as i as mine to clinging to life itself as i or mine just doing this will free life of all dukkha but hardly anyone is willing to believe this the problem is that as soon as we attach to life it becomes dukkha please remember this fact please carefully note this fact that the moment attachment arises there will be dukkha please be very careful not to forget this if we go and attach to to something good then it will bite us if we attach to if we attach to the bad as i or mine it will bite us if we whether we attach to goodness or badness good things or bad things they'll all turn around and bite us bite us with suffering and turn life into a burden make life heavy and difficult to live to the point where we might not even want to live 
Please remember this. Because all we have to do is not attach. And then nothing can bite us. Nothing becomes heavy. There's no burden in life. It's, we can live it in a way that is completely free. The most, the freest kind of life. A life that is completely void of all suffering. This is the, the highest kind of life. This is the most peaceful life. This is the kind of life that is above everything. If you are a good Christian, sincere, <laughs> genuine Christian, then you will be free of all dukkha. The thing is, nowadays, we can't find any good and sincere Christians. In the very beginning of the Bible, in just a few words, God gave the commandment, do not attach to good and evil. To phrase it a little in a longer sentence, the word God said, do not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This means exactly, don't get trapped within the meanings or values of good and evil. Don't attach to them. Don't turn good and evil into a burden. This is a commandment of God at the very beginning of the Bible. If one is a true, genuine, sincere Christian, then one will understand this and follow it. A real Christian attaches neither to good nor to evil. But although we're looking for one, we still are <clears throat> unable to find such a true and genuine Christian. Please observe that God spoke only one single time or gave only this one single direct commandment. This is the only time God spoke directly to man or to humanity and gave this one single commandment. But nobody follows it. Nobody listens. All the Christians who supposedly love God don't even follow this very first commandment. We'd, be, we'd like to find a Christian who, who is a true one. Because if we could, in the, Christ, the true and genuine Christian who follows this, this commandment, right there, we will also meet new life. If you think that God is the utmost goodness or the highest goodness, then this understanding directly contradicts the commandment to not attach to good and evil. To think that, to understand that God, to believe that God is the utmost goodness, it goes against the will of God. The will of God is that we do not attach to goodness and evil. But many people still cling to the idea that God is the utmost goodness. For this reason, it is impossible to find a true Christian. If we could find one, we would find a new life, free of all dukkha. If you're a true, sincere Christian, a really correct and proper Christian, then you won't attach to good and evil. And then at the very same time, you'll also be a true and correct Buddhist. As soon as we no longer attach to anything as I and mine, we become a genuine Buddhist. By not attaching to anything as good and evil, we also become a true Muslim, a real Hindu. By not attaching to good and evil, by not attaching to anything, we automatically become a member 
of all the religions at the same time. Not in a superficial way, but right there at the heart of religion. To attach to anything is dukkha. To not attach, to be free of seeing things as I and mine, is to immediately become a leading member of all the religions simultaneously. Therefore, to not attach to anything, not to God, not even to life, the life itself, this is new life, life free of attachment. Let us stress once again the life in which there is no attachment and clinging to anything, that is new life. And so then the, the question arises, do you want this or not? Do you want this or not? Are you interested or what? If you want this, then we'll continue speaking. We'll talk about anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing, because it is something that can help us to discover new life. The essence of anapanasati is taking up everything and looking at it until we fully realize that there's not anything worth attaching to. There's not one single thing anywhere in the universe, in nature, in life, that we should attach to as I or mine. And then we don't attach to anything anymore. This is the essence, the heart of mindfulness with breathing. The hippies back in the 60s, some of them hung around until the 70s and even 80s, in their wandering and searching for a new life, what did they find? Hippie has the meaning of being good, cr crazy about good, being drunk on good, being indulging, being lost in good. And so there's no chance, there's no possibility of discovering new life. In Anapanasati, we take everything, but then to speak, we can summarize them into four groups. These four groups, the four basic areas of our Anapanasati practice, include everything in the universe. And so we study them in order to see that none of them are worth getting drunk about or going crazy about, and there's nothing worth attaching to. First of all, we take up the first group or area is deals with life itself. Whether we're studying the body or the breathing that sustains the body, the breathing that is the source of life, we study these, we get to know what their basic nature is. We practice according to the system of anapanasati until we realize that this body and this breath, that this life, that all these material, physical, corporeal things are impermanent and uncertain, are unsatisfying, and are not self. And then seeing this, we know that there's nothing to attach to. This is the first area that we practice with. The second group deals with the very important matter of the Vedana. The Vedana, this is a Pali word. We're not going to translate it in English because nobody really knows what the proper translation is and the word feeling often confuses people. We'll talk about the Vedana. This is an absolutely crucial thing to study because the, the Vedana control us. When Vedana arise, they force us to, they force ideas 
and thoughts and actions according to the influence of these vetana. Whatever the kind of vetana, it will force the mind to to think and act in a certain way. If it's a pleasant vetana, the mind thinks of getting, of having, of keeping. If it's an unpleasant vetana, the mind thinks of destroying, of getting rid of. And if it's an uncertain, undescribable vetana, the mind runs around in circles, thinking about what this is, trying to figure it out, and getting more and more confused. This is the power of the vetana. They have, they have great mastery over us and our lives. If the vetana conditioned craving, blind want, foolish desire, then there arises attachment and we suffer. If the vetana condition up this attachment, then life becomes a burden. This is the great power of the vetana that they condition craving. So we study the vetana in anapanasati. We get to know them until we see their, their nature, that they're impermanent and uncertain, that they're unsatisfactory and that they're not self. When we see this, then we know that there's nothing worth attaching to. And so we do not allow the Vedana to condition craving. And there's no attachment, and the Vedana do not force us into slavery. They don't force us into making life a burden. This is why in Anapanasati, we work with the Vedana, this very, very important aspect of life. The vetana, when they arise, are the cause of the feeling of the, the sense or the belief in positiveness and negativeness. This positiveness and negativeness arises because of the vetana. Pleasant vetana lead to positiveness. Unpleasantness, pleasant vetana lead to negativeness. And then further, there are all the other pairs like optimism and pessimism, liking and disliking, all these things <coughs> are rooted, are conditioned in and by the vetana. And so finally, eventually, vetana always leads to attachment. In order to end attachment, we have to be free of the vetana. Positiveness and negativeness lead to attachment. Positiveness leads to liking things, wanting things, attaching to things in a good way, and this becomes a burden. Negativeness leads to disliking, hating, wanting to destroy things, to attachment in a bad way. Both this positive and negativeness leads to attachment, and both positive and negativeness lead to the vetana. In order to, to destroy this positiveness and negativeness, which causes attachment, we must get out from under the power of the vetana. We must learn how to not allow them to, uh, to force us into positiveness and negativeness. The Sukha Vetana, the happy Vetana, enslave us. This is very easy to understand, how these pleasant feelings enslave us. But the painful Vetana, the Dukkha Vetana, enslave us equally, just as much. This is difficult to understand. When there is unpleasant vetana, this unhappy vetana, then we're trapped by the thing. We have to deal with it. We have to correct it. There's some problem we have to cope with and come to terms with it. And so it ties us up. It binds us. It can even make us cry. This is how the unpleasant feelings enslave us as well. 
pleasant vedana and unpleasant vedana enslave us equally. Positive feelings and negative feelings trap us. They turn us into slaves. Not being enslaved by any of the vedana, that is new life. So this is how the second stage of anapanasati helps us to the new life. The third stage has to do with the jitta, the mind, the heart. In stage three, we study and get to know the true nature of the mind so that we're not foolish or stupid enough to cling to it as I or mine. We study the jitta, we watch it, how it works, until we know its nature. And then we see that this jitta, this mind or heart, is merely a natural element that is conditioned in a natural way. And that merely by foolish thinking, by ignorance, we take it to be I or mine. If we study the jitta until we realize this knowledge, then we'll have new life just the same. When we know that the mind is not to be clung to as I or mine, then this, this is what the third stage of anapanasati is about and how it helps us to the new life. In Buddhism, we do not hold or believe that there is a permanent self or a permanent soul. Rather, we observe that this jitta, this mind, is merely a natural element which changes and tr- transforms according to the various conditions and situations that meet it. There's not, no permanent self or soul involved in that. It's merely a natural arising process. When we see this, then we see there's no need to attach to this jitta as I or mine, and then no problems are made or created out of this mind. When we understand this jitta properly, then we are able, or the mind is able to do everything and anything correctly. Whatever we need to do, the mind can do perfectly well. We're able to to control the mind through practicing this third stage of anapanasati. We can make it joyful, delighted, cheerful, refreshed, if we wish. Or we can make it stop and be still and quiet if we need to. And most important, we learn how to make it let go of attachments, to release all attachments. When we train in this way, then we can say that we have power or influence over the mind. And having, being, having this power, this control of the mind, this is the new life. Now we come to the fourth stage, the fourth area of our anapanasati practice, which has to do with all things, has to do with everything. The word in Pali is dhamma. Dhamma means thing, or in this case, all things, everything without exception. In the fourth area, we come to know all things as they really are. In, in Pali, we have the words sankata and asankata. Sankata means a conditioned thing, a compounded thing. And asankata is the unconditioned, the uncompounded, the non-concocted. When we say knowing all things, this means to know both sankata and asankata or if we put it into your own language, into English. We can use the word 
phenomena. Phenomena means unconditioned, means conditioned things, things which are created and which have an end, which arise and cease. These conditioned, concocted things are called singular, in singular phenomenon and plural phenomena. And then there's another thing which is the opposite of these concocted phenomena, and that we call the noumenon. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard this word or how you understand it, but our understanding of this word noumenon is that it is the unconditioned thing, that which has no beginning, no end, which is not concocted. To understand all things means to understand phenomena and the noumenon. The noumenon can only be singular. There's only one. To understand these is the fourth aspect of practicing anapanasati. When we say all things, we really mean it. There's no exception to this all, all things. So in Anapanasati, we know that all things are neither I nor mine. There's nothing about them that we can take to be our self or our soul, to be my or mine. When we understand all things, both conditioned things and the unconditioned thing in this way, then there's nothing that we can attach to. When we understand everything correctly, attachment is impossible. When attachment is impossible, then there's no attachment. There's no clinging to things. And this is the new life. When we see that everything is not worth attaching to, then there's no attachment to anything in nature, in the universe. We see that things are merely natural elements. They're just naturally arising elements. And they're neither I nor mine, you nor, you, you nor yours. And then we're free, free of all attachment. And this is new life through the power of anapanasati. So let's look at all four of these together now. We see that life, the body, the breathing, is not self, is not soul, it's not I or mine. And then the feelings, these are not self, they're not soul. We can't take them to be I or mine. And then the jitta, the mind heart, Nowhere in there can we find self or soul. It's not self, it's not soul. There's no self or soul about it. And then all things, everything, is seen to be not self, anatta, not soul, anatta. There's nothing to be taken as mine or I or me or myself. We look and we don't see, we can't find a true self anywhere. Seeing this, there's nothing to attach to. There's no attachment and we are free. This complete freedom is the new life, the real, genuine new life. If we know voidness, we know that things are void of self and of soul. This is called sunyata. This is what Buddhism is about, realizing the voidness of things. Buddhism is a religion that teaches not self or not soul. In Pali, the single word anatta means not self, no soul. Self and soul in English might have different meanings, but the Pali word atta includes both their meanings. And so Buddhism teaches not self, no soul. In realizing this, that, that there is no self or soul anywhere, 
and that realizing that what there is, what we have right here, this life, it's not self, it's not soul. There's no self or soul to be found, and what we do have is not self or not, and not soul. To see this is to see anatta. To see anatta means there's nothing to attach to. We're incapable of attaching, and then we are free. The mind, the heart, is perfectly free, and that is the new life. A good Christian should interpret the symbol of the cross as the cutting of the eye. The upright of the cross is the eye, which stands for the ata, the ego. And then the other, the cross piece, cuts the eye, destroys the eye, the ata. A good Christian ought to interpret the cross in this very profound way. In seeing anatta fully, we see as well sunyata. Sunyata means voidness, voidness of self and soul. To see that there is no self, no soul, no atta, no ego, this is to see sunyata. In seeing sunyata profoundly, we see tathata. We see that things are just like they are. They just go along in their own way. Con conditioned things just go along in the way of conditioned things. And the unconditioned thing goes along in the, its own way. Things just are thus, are such. Seeing this suchness, this thusness of all things is seeing tathata. Seeing anatta, sunyata, tathata makes it impossible to attach to anything and the mind is free. And seeing this tathata, thusness of things, then we'll come to the most important realization of all. Seeing thusness leads to the realization of atammayata, atammayata. Atammayata is to see that that's enough, this is enough, meaning that's enough of attachment. Don't want to have anything more to do with attachment. We've had enough. This is called atamayada. Seeing the nature of things to the degree that we see that in seeing the nature of attachment fully, we've had enough. We don't want to have anything more to do with it. Seeing this is called atamayata, and then the mind can't help but be free. Atamayata, A-T-A-M-M-A-Y-A-T-A, -A -A -A, atamayata, means no more dependence, no more dependence on anything ever again. This word atamayata seems, when we look in the big fat Pali English dictionary of the official Pali Text Society in London. We looked in this dictionary of Mr. Rhys Davies and couldn't find this word, Adamayada. But it's written in the Pali scriptures, and that dictionary is supposed to have every word within the scriptures. It seems that the people who put the dictionary together didn't understand this word. They didn't know how to explain it, and so they were afraid to put in their dictionary a word and then write definition unknown. And so they left it out. And so for many years, nobody has paid any attention to this word because the scholars haven't been able to explain it. And then no one has been able to make use of this word. Well, now we're making use of it. Atamayata, enough, had enough not going to be dependent on attachment ever again and be free. Please memorize this word, atamayata, atamayata. Some of you have been asking about 
Mahayana Buddhism. Well, if you'd like your own special mantra, please use this one, Atamayata, Atamayata. With this mantra, this most wonderful mantra in the world, you can drive away Satan, you can drive away Mara, you can drive away any devil or demon. If you want a prayer or whatever, a mantra, then we offer you Atamayata. It will take care of all your problems. Atamayata, Atamayata. No more dependence. Enough. Practicing Anapanasati fully to its end will lead to the realization of Atamayata. And then you'll have this most wonderful mantra to use whenever you need it. I think time's up and we'll finish today's talk now.